Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for uh, spending the last few minutes, half an hour with us. Um, so my, uh, my name is Michael. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I am a uh, archeologist. Um, I started out in the 1980s and then spent 30 years in the film and television business as an animator and visual effects specialist. And when I retired in uh, 2010, uh, I went back and uh, finished off my uh, PhD in archeology. span um, When I entered into uh, my research, uh, there really was not a theoretical framework available for people who were creating um, new or making new meaning uh, from a visual or virtual perspective. So um, I really had to, to dig down deep and find various resources to sort of help me out with this. So today's discussion, or I'm going to read it a little bit because I want to make sure I, I get everything to you, um, is going to be framed around this notion of making. Um, so making, as, uh, as Ingold has pointed out, is knowledge construction in real time. For the maker, it is both knowledge discovery and along a journey and equally the challenging of accepting knowledge or those mental constructs that we develop subconsciously through exposure to interpretations or ways of knowing by others. Uh, although Ingold is widely quoted for his work on sensory experiences as means to understanding and making meaning of past cultural landscapes, it is his specific notions of ways of thinking through making and wayfaring where I found my own personal uh, discovery in meaning making. Sarah Perry describes this as crafting knowledge in artisanal epistemology, where knowledge is, is discovered or made new through the creative process of making. The body of Zeisel's uh, pioneering work is all, also relevant here in that it establishes the notion of the scholar craftsman, where meaning making is intertwined through creative mental and practical application of crafted knowledge creation in the pursuit of scientific discovery. Although Ingo has played with the notions of making as a reoccurring theme in several volumes of work, I'm drawn uh, to several distinct notions that Ingo, uh, that draws heavily from Keller, advances in both uh, in order to explain the relationship between the maker, the tool, and material that enables the act of making and thus meaning making to occur. Um, these notions include working with an umbrella plan, in effect, forming the initial conceptual big picture of artistic intent, the processional quality of tool use, in, in effect undertaking, undertaking the journey and implementation of the conceptual artistic intent, the synergy of practitioner, tool and material, in effect the agency arising from the interaction that gives rise to the narrative of making, the coupling of perception and action, in effect the combination of two halves of the artist, artist to achieve and achieve effectively the intent of making. Working with the material and not against it, um, and accepting course corrections. In combination, these notions of making uh, of the making process effectively captured my own personal uh, transformational making in digital archaeology. We start off first with the umbrella plan. Um, Keller's notions of an umbrella, umbrella plan is the practical application of organizational thoughts and tools skills and workplace uh, workspace in order to prepare the act of making. The umbrella, umbrella plan is an overarching big picture view of what an artisan would like to achieve but still lacks the minute granularity required to, for the construction of new knowledge. It is the mental preparation and ima uh, imaginary practice towards a desired outcome. Um, so effectively you're doing mental gy uh, gymnastics as you're developing your ideas um, before it comes down to paper or in from a visual perspective. I might visualize my reimagined archaeological landscape or object. I develop a mental inventory of digitally enhanced archaeological features, elements, and notions that I may want to make real. My conceptual umbrella plan is shaped by the experiences I gained during the testing of these notions, where I developed a, a pipeline to interactively engage with the historical and artistic elements to be developed uh, in digital archaeology. By testing the tools and understanding the constraints of the 3D creation process, I'm mentally negotiating future uh, decisions over what could 
and could not be represented virtually by the software. Getting back to what Istel was actually talking about uh, in the first discussion. I find myself redefining the initial umbrella plan to accommodate technology and new field and research data developments that constantly leapfrog the digital production plans. These are mental and practical rehearsals, like all acts of knowledge making that come before are interrogated by the next act of creation and as such facilitated the process of creating meaning unique to this maker. I would also add that during this time, the London Charter and its founding notions of agency, authority, authenticity, and transparency, and additional uh, necessary uh, are additional and necessary parts to consider of the, um, uh, in the umbrella plan of this research, allowing the maker to both understand and recognize the con concerns and constraints of the attempting to visualize or virtualize the past and guide them through a maker. And, guide them through as the maker engages digitally with unconstructed knowledge. For Engel, once an umbrella plan exists, the practitioner, uh, artisan, maker engages the task itself. It is in many ways a pathway to completion, getting ready, setting out, carrying on, and fish finishing off. There is a narrowing of focus and an acceptance that along the way there will be negotiations between the mental and physical realities which will force the maker to accept course, correct, uh, course corrections through a series of wayfaring points. It is these moments that the new knowledge is constructed and old preconceptions revised. It's still not acknowledged as the central task is still working towards completing the job as conceptualized. Only later in the process of reflection and negotiation, those changes made the way uh, made away from the original mental image and umbrella plan do these new notions become concrete. These experiments help to lay out the tools, working environments, skills and talent uh, needed to execute archaeologically engaged virtual, re uh, virtual reimagined environments. They inform as well as keep secret challenges that would need to be negotiated later. Along the path of discovery, the plan of achieving a virtual representation remains the task at hand but my mental course corrections uh, shift the means of achieving that goal and some of the intents behind the goal based on the new knowledge I'm engaging with. Throughout bouts of negotiation and angst, I carry on with the task at hand while acknowledging the shifts in motivation and outcomes that change along the way. Keller states that deciding uh, when a project is finished involves a judgment by the artisan that uh, that a part of the physical world sufficiently approximates a mental image of the finished product, i.e. we decide uh, mentally when it's ready to uh, finish off the project, not the other way around. Towards the end of any digital project, I move into a finishing off phase, the refinement of more precisely uh, acceptance of what could be achieved with the assembled skills, materials, and knowledge at the time, while acknowledging the components of the build that could not be achieved in this iteration. During this process, I'm continually reminded that reimagination is far from complete. However, during the finishing off phase, I want to ensure that the final product isn't overworked by means of new layers of details that haven't been fully vetted for fit. Um, Thus, the finishing off phase is important as a realization by the maker that the initial mental image in the final physical object had, some, had reached some kind of alignment that the maker can live with. Uh, arriving at the realization in the process of negotiation, rationalization, and instance of new knowledge being created. The synergy, synergy of practitioner and tool and material. The maker, tool, and material all have narratives which, uh, when combined, have new meaning or make new meaning. Collectively, they tell stories which Gibson suggests mingle in the present, dynamically changing based on the affordances with the task gate, the tool, the material, and the maker. Object itineraries and their stories do not come ready made, but in fact are drawn out of the engagement with the tools, material, and environment in which the artist is engaged. Thus, in making, new stories or knowledge is made. The contentiousness and speculative nature of representing something with limited available historical narrative, narrative suggests assumed interpretations as either or choices or 
that are right or wrong. In following Ingold's notions of synergy of the practitioner to a material, I challenge accepted norms by playing with the elasticity of the tools themselves, my own interpretations of knowledge research, historical writings, and the artistic, practical, and archaeological sensibilities I endeavored to master within myself. I choose one interpretation over another by letting the materials speak for themselves. In creating an alternative story in which old assumptions are confronted and new knowledge is constructed, the outcome is different than the norm, yet still viable if new modes of interpretation are engaged. In effect, as the maker and eventually the consumer, I think about the assumptions inherent in the archaeological data. They are negotiated, negotiated in real time within virtual space, a contradiction to those assumptions through the visualization of an alternative interpretation that enable not only by myself, but users to reflect on the viability, variability, and certainty of their meaning-making process. Engel views the coupling of perception and action as an indication of mastery within the artistic craft-making process. It is a natural completion of one move, uh, movement that sets up and leads into another, such as walking or sawing a piece of wood. The seemingly rhythmic motions of the artist and the tool and the creation of an object is in fact a series of dynamic course corrections, all unique in delivery, however producing similar outcomes. The literature, uh, current digital field practice generally provides no pair of data for the micro decisions one makes and is adopted along the way to new archaeological knowledge construction. The literature itself fails to detail any coupling of perception and action by the various makers who have endeavored to construct new knowledge at the moment. Thus, archaeological knowledge continues to be imagined and visualized in the same manner, both physically and digitally, by scholars, artists, and craftspeople alike, even though the archaeological object or landscape are clearly built through the unique vision, context, and time of the original makers. It is because the mental images and assumptions we carry with us are static, as suggested by Dennett, or is it because we see the cumulative end result of the subconscious pivots in the making of the object, and event, event, that, event, <laughs> I'm going to pass that. Does it bring us back to a uh, static vision? <laughs> Far from being repetitive, the making process is iterative and challenges us to recognize that archaeolo archaeological knowledge construction, digital or not, has its own itineraries which reveals themselves uh, when ready. This one's uh, for Stuart. I, just on a, sh a short note, I had asked uh, all digital ar archaeologists to send us uh, send you pictures of them at work, and uh, Stuart decided to send me this one, so that was <laughs> appropriate for this particular slide. Um, Engel, like Keller, goes to Great Lake to speak about the materiality of the material being worked. Uh, the material has a narrative, and it is through the synergy with the tool and the maker that the narratives are materialized. For 3D computer graphics, the greatest challenge is understanding that the materiality of the digital object within virtual space. 3D objects are made of interconnected networks of polygons when joined becomes a surface or a face within virtual space. That surface joins with other surfaces to become an outer shell of an object visualized. Surfaces can hold textures, lighting, animation, and other model attributes, which in unison helps to convey a visual representation of the physical object being mimicked. Like wood, clay, or other physical materials, 3D objects have their own unique materiality, constraints, benefits, which dictate the effectiveness of the 3D animation in an environmental space. The modeling animation environmental uh, software, like the tools uh, Carpenter or Blacksmith would use, also dictate the way digital materials respond to the maker. Thus. There is an immediate tension between the tools, the material, and the maker until the coupling of perception and action is achieved. Like all scholar craftsmen, the material we are trying to mold into our vision both binds and blinds us. However, the digital realm does allow us to reach beyond the constraints of the physical world, as such elements become fantastical interpretations, as the technology allows us to do so. We are able to bend, 
the 3D world in some ways, but not very successfully in others. We are bound to the rules of the digital world and freed from some of the physicality of the real world material we are attempting to visualize. It was seemingly an unnatural contradiction, yet one that controls how archaeological objects and landscapes are represented in 3D space. Such micro-negotiations occurred as we attempt to reproduce real-life examples within digital space, sometimes in an organic shape, sometimes in a texture map, or even the inability for a mouse or a digital pen to accurately draw a desired shape. All of these compromises play in shifting our mental image from the ideal representation to our actual final outcome. Wayfaring is a term used to describe points in which we course correct or shift our expectations in the act of creation through reflective interrogation of the physical reality of the mental intent. It is more than a casual acknowledgement that a change has occurred, but rather a conscious recognition that the course correction is changing our direction and our mental map. Based on the skill and synergy of the maker, tool, and material, the flow or performance of making is, is responsive to the course corrections made. The sum of those reflexive interrogations and mental physical course corrections becomes the end product. Those interrogations facilitate the continual reflexivity as the decisions we make and the new information we discover leading to numerous course corrections and creation of new thought about the archaeological unknown. For every wayfaring point, there is angst, doubt, trepidation. However, it becomes a fork in the decision-making process that informs whether the decision is a desired construction of knowledge or an endpoint for one line of reasoning. Wayfaring points are forced in the decision-making path. And as such, those discarded paths do represent alternative directions of thought and constructive knowledge within the virtual landscape. With the technical ability of digital archaeology and the documentation of paradata and the decision making of digital archaeological thought, these discarded wayfaring points can be procedurally revisited and retested when and if conditions allow for those alternative notions in the future. Thus, the decision to discard or shift direction is like a form of violent memory, as Mashenko suggests, one which marks the digital landscape, not visually, but through a knowledge that a choice has been made, means the discarding of alternative paths or visions. And so we need to document and remember those wayfaring points in order to re-examine, rediscover possible alternative meaning-making paths not taken but mapped for possible exploration later date. By the way, this, this image here is, a, uh, is an archival image of all the paradata done on a particular project that uh, we did in VR. And it's, it followed the, the, the vision of uh, the London Charter. Um, and obviously, if you've read the London Charter, it gives a, uh, a direction of the way that we should operate in digital archaeology, but isn't a complete form yet. The aims of the London Charter are worth aspiring to. However, they are not uh, sacrosanct and must be constantly reflected upon in order to retain clarity for what and for whom we have created this new knowledge. I believe that peri the paradata process is the means of which makes real the aims of the London Charter and allows for those aims to be challenged and reflected upon. Paradata, although discussed theoretically at great lengths in the framing of the digital archaeology, has not been practically applied within the virtual heritage to any great extent. Recently, Waterston, in an effort to address this issue of virtual archaeological imagery and its effects on general public expectations and visualizations within archaeology, has been visually uh, has been visually authentic, actively engaged in paradigm practice as a foundation aspect of visualizing archaeological sites in St. Kilda and Scarborough in Scotland by recording not only the reflections and course corrections, but also the data used to facilitate construction of knowledge beyond the archaeological uh, findings, Watterson is demystifying the visualization process for archaeologists and public consumers as well. In essence, providing the ingredients used to qualify and explain the archaeological visualization process, demonstrating that visualization is an interpretation by scientific means and not a sacrosanct truth.
Following the notions uh, of Purcell, uh, Marinowski, and Trigger, digital archaeology offers a kind of pragmatic eclecticism. Digital archaeologists are makers of material meaning. We construct networks of uh, knowledge in which power, authority, and authenticity are embedded within the reflexive, uh, reflexively challenged by the digital means through our professional, academic, and cultural norms. These challenges represent course corrections and wayfaring points in which new knowledge paths are taken and others are abandoned or shelved. As knowledge is made through these moments of reflection, a progressive nonlinear procedural path is created, which is unique to the maker, but through the use of paradata and technology, this knowledge can be known and engaged with by the wider group of archaeological consumers. As such, uh, as decisions are being discarded or promoted, uh, we rationalize these decisions by emotional logical means. We tack, as Allison Wiley suggests, between theories, methodologies, and practices, searching for or coding between archaeological known and unknown uh, to create uh, new knowledge. This, quite frankly, is archaeological uh, wayfaring. So, to conclude, digital archaeology is more than just visualizing the past. It is a sensory making experience that both draws theoretically and methodologically from the archaeological record and beyond. As such, the act of make, uh, making meaning is more important than the final outcome. All knowledge is manufactured, and thus the journey is the key. As digital archaeologists, we need first to accept that what we do is archaeology, and second, that visualizing, visualizing the archaeological unknown digitally, we are making new archaeological meaning. Thank you.